They said it was impossible. They laughed, called it madness. After all, who in their right mind would try to grow a forest in the middle of a desert? But 10 years later, those same critics fell silent because what happened in China, no one in the world was prepared to see. What looked like hopeless sand turned into a green miracle. And this is the story of the most ridiculed and most victorious environmental project of our time. If you noticed when the Gobi Desert started creeping forward, not with explosions or quakes, but with wind. A constant wind heavy with sand that buried villages, blanketed crops, and turned forests into dust. Every year, around 3,000 square kilometers of China vanished under this invisible monster. But this wasn't just about scenery. Desertification struck at the heart of agriculture, the economy, and the lives of hundreds of millions. Entire communities were swallowed up, fertile land became dry powder, and major cities like Beijing found themselves choking on sandstorms that crossed borders. At first, the world saw it as a local issue, maybe even inevitable, but for China, it was existential. Either they fought the desert head on, or they'd be slowly erased from the map. When the first images appeared of workers burying straw in the sand and planting trees in the middle of nowhere, the world scoffed. Experts called it insane. Environmentalists said it was a waste of resources. The desert doesn't bend to human will, they said. The criticism was brutal. The project was dubbed Green Theater, which a performance to distract the public. Burying money in the sand became an international punchline, printed in newspapers and repeated by commentators as a symbol of absurdity. No one believed a forest could grow where even grass refused to. But while the world pointed fingers, the Chinese kept going, quietly. No applause, no glowing headlines, just grit, sweat, and an idea that seemed too crazy to ignore. Desertification stopped being an environmental concern and became a national threat. In places like Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia, millions saw their crops fail, wells run dry, and homes abandoned to the marching sands. In 2006 alone, 17 sandstorms struck the country, some so intense that particles traveled across oceans, reaching the west coast of the United States. This wasn't just China's problem anymore. It was a global wake-up call. For the Chinese government, this was a survival test. Economic growth meant nothing if the land itself was disappearing. Something had to be done, and fast. Back in 1978, amid chaos, China announced the unthinkable, a wall not made of stone but of trees. Dubbed the Great Green Wall, the plan was simple on paper and monumental in practice, a forest belt over 2,800 miles long to halt the desert's advance. But it wasn't just a reforestation campaign, it was a national movement in schools, soldiers, farmers, and scientists working together, a decades-long effort projected to continue until 2050. This bold vision aimed not only to restore degraded lands, but to reshape the bond between the Chinese people and their soil. It was a gamble against time, against nature, against the world's disbelief. Momentum built quickly. Millions were enlisted to plant trees, including students and military personnel. The government offered financial incentives for farmers to convert eroded land into forest. Every citizen had a tree planting quota. But more than a campaign, it became a patriotic symbol. Planting a tree wasn't just an eco-friendly act. It became an act of love for the homeland. A symbolic war where the nation faced off against its most deceptive enemy, the desert. And this level of ecological mobilization had never been seen before. It wasn't just about changing landscapes, it was about changing mindsets. A whole nation planting, with no guarantee that anything would grow. It almost seemed like a joke. Planting trees in the middle of a desert, how could roots take hold in soil with no nutrients, under a sky that sees rain maybe once a year? And yet, they planted thousands, millions, in rows that looked both defiant and hopeful. Experts pointed to the data, sky-high mortality rates. Up to 85% of saplings died within their first year. Fragile monocultures like eucalyptus and poplar couldn't handle the Gobi's heat, drought, and winds. Everything pointed to a spectacular failure. But there was something deeper behind the stubbornness, a quest for environmental redemption, for control over the land. It was a gesture of faith, not religious, but national. And while most of the trees died, the few that survived were proof that maybe, just maybe, it wasn't entirely crazy. The early years were brutal. Images of dead forests were everywhere. Fields of bare trunks. Not a leaf in sight, dust coating everything. It was as if the desert was mocking humanity's attempt to stop it. 
Sandstorms wiped out months of work in a single afternoon. Irrigation paths vanished under dunes within hours. Where there was hope, silence remained. The critics grew louder, and even within China, environmental dissent started to rise. Failure seemed inevitable, the kind of project future textbooks would use as a cautionary tale. And still, they pressed on, with more caution, with more science, but with the same unshakable belief the desert would not win. In China, when the government says everyone will plant trees, it's not a metaphor. Students had planting quotas, military units became green battalions, entire cities grabbed shovels and headed to the dunes. Yes, it was forced at first, but it became collective. Over time, people began to feel pride. Planting turned into tradition. In 1981, China established National Tree Planting Day, celebrated every March 12th. From 1982 to 2021, it's estimated that 78 billion trees were planted, and while many didn't survive, the act of planting left its mark. On the land, on the people, and on a nation that was slowly reinventing itself, tree by tree. As China buried straw and dug roots into the sand, the world hurled critiques. International headlines mocked the idea. This will never work, they said. It's a waste of money, time, and people. Scientists warned the species weren't native. The soil was being depleted for nothing. Monocultures could create new environmental disasters. To the world, China looked like a clumsy giant trying to fight climate change with shovels and wishful thinking. Inside China, ecologists began to voice concern. There were real worries about biodiversity and overuse of water resources. It's like trying to put out a fire with gasoline, some said. Then came something unexpected, uh, straw checkboards. A simple, almost primitive method, but remarkably effective. Squares of straw laid across the dunes, forming a grid that slowed the wind, anchored the sand, and created stable microenvironments for plants. The material? Rice straw. Agricultural waste, once discarded, now carted into the desert and transformed into shields against erosion. A homegrown solution, using what was available, applied with persistence and ingenuity. These grids cut wind speed by up to 99.5% in the worst hit areas. Over time, the dunes stopped shifting, and that gave life, quite literally, a chance to take root. For the first time, the desert wasn't advancing, it was being held back. The early hope was buried, now, along with millions of dead trees. What once looked like a green carpet turned into a brown graveyard. Mortality rates hit 85% in some areas. Scientific criticism surged. Many pointed to the strategic error of monoculture. Planting the same species in fragile terrain under extreme climate was a recipe for disaster. Experts demanded urgent changes, warning that even the existing biodiversity was at risk. The Chinese government faced a dilemma, continue a project that had already consumed massive resources or admit failure and pull back. The answer surprised everyone, don't quit, transform. The desert, like a cunning enemy, struck back. Stronger sandstorms buried months of effort in hours. Irrigation systems disappeared. Roads were blocked. People displaced once again. Climate conditions tested every step forward. Areas that barely saw 10 millimeters of rain a year now faced even harsher droughts. The soil, loose and depleted, couldn't hold water, even when it was delivered by truck. It was the darkest moment in the entire endeavor. Critics seemed vindicated. The land was merciless. But China didn't retreat. Instead, it investigated, adapted, and reinvented its strategy. After the initial collapse, China realized brute force wasn't enough. What was needed was ecological intelligence, adaptive science, and millennia-old patience. The project hit a crucial turning point, letting go of ego and embracing environmental humility. Authorities started listening to scientists, mistakes were acknowledged, monocultures gave way to diversity, native species adapted to desert life were introduced, satellite monitoring began to track plantings in real time. What began as a political campaign evolved into a national ecological innovation lab. Failures became data. Successes started to bloom. Mechanization changed everything. What was once done with shovels and manpower now moved faster and more precisely with specialized machinery. Diggers that laid perfect checkboards, drip irrigation systems, sensors reading soil in real time. Now vast areas could be covered in record time. Straw was laid with millimeter precision. Saplings arrived pre-treated to survive the harsh climate. It was a new era for the Great Green Wall, and more strategic, more sustainable, more powerful. This shift from manpower to engineering didn't replace the spirit of the project, it amplified it. The battle shifted from brute strength to a war of ingenuity. 
This new phase brought a holistic approach. It wasn't enough to just plant trees. Functional ecosystems had to be created, and so smart forests were born. Green zones with complementary species capable of thriving in extreme environments. Goji berries, tamarisks, sea buckthorn, hardy plants with deep roots and a thirst for survival. Together, they formed a living barrier that could resist drought, support microfauna, and slowly regenerate the soil. With the help of bioengineering, organic soil enhancement, and microorganisms, what once looked like lifeless desert began to turn fertile. It wasn't magic, it was science, adapted to the climate, the land, and the dream of making the impossible bloom. When a railway was proposed through the Taklamakan Desert, engineers laughed. Too much sand, too much wind, too much risk. But China answered with a bold idea, protect the tracks with living vegetation. Straw belts, tough grasses, native shrubs, and small trees were aligned as a natural shield. Not only was the railway built, but it's withstood decades of storms. The same method was applied to roads, and even a high-speed highway through the desert. This synergy between engineering and ecology created a new kind of infrastructure. One that didn't just cut through nature, but coexisted with it. It was a victory not just of technique, but of philosophy. The impossible started showing up in satellite images. Green patches, where once there was only sand. Lines of vegetation spreading like healing scars across China's wounded land. The desert was finally retreating. Between 2016 and 2020, over 21 million acres were converted into green zones. Cities once choked by dust could now see blue skies. Winds that once carried destruction began to lose their power. The forest wasn't just surviving, it was advancing. What had once been dismissed as a fantasy had become a source of national pride. The once ridiculed project was finally bearing fruit, both literally and symbolically. In 2024, China reached a historic milestone, a continuous 3,000-kilometer green belt surrounding the Taklamakan Desert, a true ecological wall, not made of concrete, but built with patience, research, and resilience. The images spoke for themselves, green lines replacing dunes on maps, forests rising where humanity once said it couldn't be done. Scientists who once called it green theater now came to study how it worked. China didn't just answer its critics, it inspired them. The silence that followed from the skeptics was louder than any official statement, because when even the desert bows, there's nothing left to argue. What began as a punchline became a model. Countries in Africa's Sahel region began studying and applying Chinese methods. The same happened in the Middle East and Central Asia. International delegations visited the restored zones. Experts learned about straw grids, mechanization, native species, and community involvement. Even the African Union invited Chinese experts to collaborate on their own green wall projects. China, once mocked, was now exporting its ecological wisdom. What was once a domestic crisis had become a tool for global transformation. What began as a joke became a global environmental legacy. China's forest cover grew from 10% in 1949 to over 25% by 2024. Once abandoned regions are now flourishing, and the word impossible was buried alongside straw in the dunes. Beyond the environmental benefits came economic ones. Ecotourism, sustainable farming, the cultivation of fruit and herbs in once sterile zones. Cities on the brink now export products. Forgotten communities now thrive. But the greatest achievement can't be measured in acres. It's measured in pride, inspiration, and transformation. The world laughed, but the desert silenced the world with leaves, roots, and life. China proved that even the impossible can bloom. But now the question is, what about the rest of us? Do we have the courage, the vision, and the patience to turn disaster into hope? If this story changed how you see things, consider subscribing to the channel and sharing it with someone who needs to hear it. And tell me in the comments, do you think it's possible to transform other deserts around the world?